two. All right, let's open with prayer. Dear God, I know that though I have done my best, I am still to blame. Yet, I am comforted, for you have died for me and covered me with blood from your holy wounds. I am surely baptized in you, and I have heard the word through which you have called me and have commanded me to believe and have assured me of grace and life. With these blessings, I will gladly go ahead, not anxious and hesitating and asking in doubt or fear. Who knows what judgment God in heaven will hold against me? I now live in the assurance of the gracious decree which God in heaven has given against the curse of the law. He that believeth in the Son of Man hath eternal life. Amen. All right, Job chapter 28. Job 28. Now, Job is pretty much finished talking to his three friends. And uh, chapter 28, he presents to us a wisdom psalm. This is a passage of scripture in which uh, it celebrates God's wisdom. And so let's just jump into it. This is Job speaking. Surely there is a vein for the silver and a place for gold where they find it. Iron is taken out of the earth and brass is molten out of the stone. All right, so, so what he's going to be talking about here is he's going to be talking about the art of mining, whether it is for precious stones or for metals or for precious metals. He setteth an end to darkness and searcheth out all perfection. The miner does, that is. Uh, he goes where no foot has ever trod. He goes down deep into the earth. Uh, and the stones of darkness and the shadow of death. The flood breaketh out of the inhabit, from the inhabitant, even the waters forgotten of the foot. They are dried up, but they are gone away from men. He's talking here about the fact that when you do mining and you dig deep in the earth, sometimes you uncover uh, rivers and, and, and uh, pools of water that were unexpected. And sometimes all it takes is a chisel and a hammer blow for water to come shooting out of the, uh, of the, uh, of the stones because you've tapped into a reservoir of water. Uh, and verse 5, as for the earth, out of it come, cometh bread, and under it is turned up, as it were, a fire. So here's an interesting thing. Job understands by divine inspiration that the internal parts of the earth are molten and fiery. All right, that's a, that's an interesting fact right there that, uh, so out of the earth comes bread. That is, we get our food from the earth. Uh, the stones of it are the place of sapphires, and it hath dust of gold. There is a path which no fowl knoweth, and which the vulture's eye hath not seen. The lion's whelps have not trodden it, nor the fierce lion passed by it. So there are deep pits in the mines as men have done dug deep into the earth where no creature has ever been. He putteth forth his hand upon the rock. He overturneth the mountains by the roots. He cutteth out rivers among the rocks and his eye seeth every precious thing. So the miners know where to dig and how to dig in order to find every precious thing. He bindeth the floods from overflowing 
and the thing that is hid bringeth he forth to light. So all this ingenuity, man's technological prowess, uh, and yet, he says in verse 12, but where shall wisdom be found? Where is the place of understanding? All right, so he's leaving that question hanging. So he talks about man's ingenuity, man's technological mastery over the world. And I mean, that has been exacerbated a, a thousandfold in our day. You know, we know things that our ancestors didn't know at all. And, uh, and so we see the wonders of man's creativity and man's ingenuity in dealing with the world around him. And, uh, but then Job asked, but where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? The word wisdom is slightly different from the word knowledge. Knowledge means to have data. All right? It means that there are certain facts and realities that you know. And you know these things for the purpose of using them. When it comes to the knowledge of doctrine, the knowledge of the teaching of the Word of God, you know these things from being taught them in the Word so that you may believe them and that you may act accordingly. All right? Wisdom, however, is... Uh, is is not so much about the facts that we know so much as the ability to make proper use of the truth, right? To 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 not only discern the truth, but to have the know-how to put it into practice and to apply it to your life, and that's the difference between knowledge. And uh, so, so we know, we know that Jesus died to pay for all the sins of the world. Why? Because the Bible tells us this in many different ways over and over again. And it is the centrality of our religious faith. We know this from hearing it from the word and we believe this and we are thus saved by this Word of God, which the Holy Spirit uses. Then we begin to learn how do we apply this to our life? All right? How how do I apply this to my life? So I learn through through study of the Word and through experience. I learn that when my conscience is is plaguing me, when I'm sorrowful because of my failings. Uh, that I am to remember that my sins have been paid for and I am to cling to that promise of God and take comfort in it. And that's wisdom at work, you see. So the knowledge of God is the things that we believe and the things that we know we are to do. The wisdom of God that he gives to us in his word is the ability to apply it and to make use of it so that uh, it, it bears fruit in our life. All right. Verse 13. Man knoweth not the price thereof, that is, of wisdom. Neither is it found in the land of the living, the price of wisdom, the value. The depth saith, it is not in me, and the sea saith, it is not with me. So, the, the value of wisdom. Wisdom is so important that on all the earth there is not enough to pay for wisdom. That's how valuable it is. Um, uh, it cannot be gotten for gold, neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx or the sapphire. The gold and crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. 
No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold. So in the first part of the chapter, he's talking about the ingenuity of man digging in the earth and finding precious metals, other metals, precious stones, all the things that we dig for in mines. And he asks, where is wisdom to be found? And, he, and, and part of his answer here is, all of the riches that we dig out of the earth will not pay for it. All right, you will not get it by paying for it with everything that the ingenuity of man can pull out of the earth. Then he says in verse 20, Whence then cometh wisdom? And where is the place of understanding? So he repeats here in verse 20 what he said in verse 12. It's like the chorus of a song. right? And uh, so once again he asks, where does wisdom come from? And uh, where is the place of understanding? Seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living and kept close from the fowls of the air, destruction and death say, we have heard the fame thereof with our ears. All right, so nobody knows where to get wisdom from. But, in verse 23, God understandeth the way thereof. And he knoweth the place thereof. For he looketh to the ends of the earth and seeth under the whole heaven to make the weight for the winds and he weigheth the waters by measure. When he made a decree for rain, for the rain and a way for the lightning of the thunder, then did he see it and declare it. He prepared it, yea, he searched it out. So God has the, he has cornered the market on wisdom. All right. He is the one who understands it. He is the one who owns it. And he therefore is the one to give it. And unto man, verse 28, unto man he saith, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Now this is also spoken of quite a number of times in the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So here we have the same, the same idea as Solomon in the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. And once again, when the term the fear of the Lord is mentioned, the word fear there means the worship of the Lord or the reverence for the Lord. All right? Uh, it doesn't... It doesn't mean that you necessarily shake in your boots at the thought of God. That's part of it. You know, there are times when we ought to shake in our boots. All right. But what it means is the worship or the reverence for God. Um, Jonah, when he was in the, in the hole of the ship sleeping and they came and they rebuked him because he wasn't helping to keep the ship afloat. Uh, so they came down and they got him and they said, who are you, you sleeper? Get up, you lazy bum. And uh, and who are you anyway? And he says, uh, he tells them who he is. He says, I fear Jehovah. Right? And in other words, he says, I, I, I am uh, a devotee of, I I belong to the religion of the true God, Jehovah. And uh, so here, when it says the fear of the Lord, it means the worship of God, the reverence for God. Uh, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. All right, so <clears throat> the whole chapter is meant to lead us up to this part. All the ingenuity of man, but where is wisdom? Wisdom is found 
at its source, which is God. And God knows it, and he says, the fear of the Lord is wisdom, to depart from evil is understanding. So if we worship the Lord, and if we depart from evil, this is wisdom in action. All right, chapter 29, 30, and 31. Job is now going to do, he's going to do three moves. In chapter 29, his move is, remember when I was happy and things were going well? Oh, for the good old days, right? That's chapter 29. Then in chapter 30, he's going to go, but now even cavemen mock me. Now my life is crummy, right? And then in chapter 31 uh, is a big extended, why is this happening to me? All right, so, so this is what hopefully we'll get through the whole thing. All right, so moreover, Job continued his parable and said, Oh, that I were as in months past and in the days when God preserved me, I wish it was back then. When his candle shined upon my head and when by his light I walked through darkness as I was in the days of my youth when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me, when I washed my steps with butter, And the rock poured me out rivers of oil. In other words, when he lived a life of ease to to ordering his steps in butter, it sounds kind of gooey to us, but he's talking about how how safely he trod. He 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 had a smooth life. If you can picture yourself bathing your feet in butter. He had a smooth life and everything went uh, as it should. And when I went out to the gate through the city, when I prepared my seat in the street, so I was one of the highly respected elders. I had a place in the city gate, which is where judgments and court cases took place. The young men saw me and hid themselves because I was so respectable and so highly regarded that they were shy and afraid to talk to me. And the aged rose and stood up. They they stood up when I came into a room. The princes refrained talking and laid their hand on their mouth. So when I showed up, even the princes watched what they were saying. The nobles held their peace and their tongue cleaved to the roof of their mouth. So he said, remember back in the day when people used to respect me and look up to me and everything in my life was going well? Oh, for those days. Then he says in, uh, in verse 11, when the ear heard me, then it blessed me. And when the eye saw me, it gave witness to me. So people respected me, all right? And uh, they looked forward to what I had to say. Verse 12, because I delivered the poor that cried and the fatherless and him that had none to help him. So I was very solicitous to help those who were, uh, who, who were disadvantaged. The blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. So he helped people who were in trouble to get them back on their feet, and they blessed him and sang for joy over what he did for them. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My judgment was as a robe and a diadem, so I had good sound judgment. I was eyes to the blind, feet was I to the lame. I was a father to the poor, and the cause which I knew not, I searched out. So if I didn't know something, I'd study up on it. I break the jaws of the wicked and pluck the spoil out of his teeth. So, so he says, when, when life was going good for me, 
I didn't use that beneficence in order to uh, benefit myself. I used my my reputation and my money and my goods in order to bless people who were helpless and in trouble and in need. All right. So, uh, verse eighteen, he says, "Then I said." I shall die in my nest and I shall multiply my days as the sand. In other words, I'm going to live a long, a long, nice life and finally die at home in my bed, uh, uh, safe and sound. My root was spread out by the waters. In other words, I had good fortune that everything, uh, everything was going positively for me, just like when you plant the root of something by a source of water rather than out in the desert, it flourished. The dew lay all night upon my branch. My glory was fresh in me and my bow was renewed in my hand. Unto me gave men ear and waited and kept silence at my counsel. After my words, they spake not again, for my speech dropped upon them. In other words, when I gave advice, that was the end of the discussion because everybody just nodded their head and went and did what I said because my advice was good. My advice was good. And they waited for me as for the rain. They looked forward to my advice like they looked forward to the rain. And... Uh, and you know, now we don't notice this in our modern world, we living in the northeast of the United States, because rain always to us, it seems to put a damper on our plans, right? But in if you lived in the Middle East, rain was something that was like Christmas time, you know, presents under the tree, it was looked forward to. If I laughed on them, uh, they believed it not, and the light of my countenance they cast not down. I chose out their way and sat chief and dwelt as a king in the army and as one that comforted the mourners. So he, he, he closes chapter 30 saying that he was, that, that he was in a position of great influence, power, and authority in the community but he didn't use that to enrich himself or to bless himself. He used it for the sake of, of others. All right, so that's chapter 29. Oh, remember when life was good? All right. Then, chapter 30. Chapter 30, the title is the first two words, but now. <laughs> uh, oh, man. So he says, but now... They that are younger than I have me in derision. So the young people make fun of me. They, they, tell, they tell irritating jokes at my expense. Whose fathers I would have disdained to have set with the dogs of my flock. These young whippersnappers who make fun of me and... Uh, and who disrespect me now, I wouldn't have even hired their fathers to be with the dogs of my flock. Yea, where to might the strength of their hands profit me in whom old age have perished or was perished? In other words, the kind of people, the kind of people who were so unsound and so unwise that few of them ever lived to a ripe old age. All right? And then he speaks about a group of people. Now, there are, there are, there's a word in the Greek language for such people. And the, the Greek word is troglodytes. A troglodyte. Uh, or what we would call cavemen. All right, cavemen. In evolutionary thinking, cavemen were primitive, primitive human beings who didn't know anything and hadn't mentally developed to the point 
where they could do things like farm and build uh, houses and build communities. So they they lived for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years in caves, right? And that's the that's the evolutionary understanding of man that man was originally primitive and backward and that only over many many thousands of years did man develop the brain and the uh, skills uh, to make use of the world around him and to use things like tools and to build houses and all that kind of stuff that's the evolutionary thinking but the Bible teaches us the exact opposite and the Bible teaches this to us with abject sincerity and intensity Adam could have built modern cities if he had wanted to Adam and Eve were completely highly developed people as a matter of fact if you could go in a time machine where would you like to go in your time machine sir I would like to go back to the Garden of Eden and I would like to hide behind a tree and just get a peek of Adam and Eve you know in the garden when they were still uh, righteous before God I would love to see Adam and Eve. So, very well, type that into the time machine and back you go into, and there you are behind the tree. And you see these creatures who make you look like a stain upon the air around you. They are so magnificently beautiful perfect and healthy and full of vigor and life that you look like just a bunch of stuff floating around in the air. And that's all you would need to see to understand what God created in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were not primitive. All right? uh, they were newborn. And, and by the way, they were created, they were created grown up. So when Adam, when Adam opened his eyes the moment he was created, when God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, he was, he was a fully developed adult man. And when Eve was created from the part of Adam's side and brought to the man, she was a fully developed adult woman, right? And they were both glorious and they had no need for anything like clothing because they were filled with holiness and they were filled with openness to the world around them and to God and to each other. And there was nothing to hide, nothing to be ashamed of. And so the point I'm trying to get to is if you saw Adam and Eve, you would never think of primitive human beings running around in caves for hundreds of thousands of years before it finally dawned on one head-scratching little semi-monkey uh, that, uh, you know, if I take this and use it to smack this. Good thing happened. <laughs> you know. Uh, so, so where do cavemen come from? Cavemen were people who, from necessity, were forced out of society to live in places uh, where they were solitary and where they were removed from. Uh, civilization. And that's what cavemen actually were. Uh, they were not primitive semi-humans developing slowly, but they were, they were, uh, the kind of people that you chase away with sticks and make them live in the woods. So, he says, uh, in verse three, for want and famine they were solitary, fleeing into the wilderness 
in former time desolate and waste. The only place where they could get any peace and quiet was out in the waste and desolate wilderness. Who cut up mallows by the bushes and juniper roots for their meat. They had to eat the most meager, useless stuff that no civilized person would eat. They were driven forth from among men. They cried after them as after a thief. Get out of here, you bums. That's basically what what happened. To dwell in the cliffs of the valleys, in the caves of the earth, and in the rocks. Among the bushes they brayed, under the nettles they were gathered together. They were the children of fools, yea, children of base men. They were viler than the earth. So these were the people whom society rejected. See, when uh, in, in the modern world we have become so morally inferior as, as a culture that when we have people like this, instead of chasing them out into the woods, we elect them to be presidents. <laughs> you know, we, we, we make them leaders among men. And we consider them wise and fantastic. We idolize people who are corrupt and degenerate. And we, and we devalue people who are good. So, anyway, so the cavemen. So what, what, uh, what Job is saying now, now even cavemen think I'm a joke. And so he's, this is like the worst thing. Even those people. Even those people. He says in verse 9, Now am I their song, yea, I am their byword. They abhor me, they flee far from me, and spare not to spit in my face. Because he hath loosed my cord and afflicted me, they have also let loose the bridle before me. So, because of the misfortune that God has laid upon me, even these terrible people uh, who can't even live together in society uh, and who can't get along with other human beings and so they have to go out and live in caves, even people like that take every opportunity they can to mock me and afflict me and spit in my face. Upon my right hand rise the youth, They push away my feet and they raise up against me the ways of their destruction. So, juvenile delinquents afflict me constantly. They mar my path and they set forward my calamity. They have no helper. They came upon me as a wide breaking in of waters, like a flood, all these, all these, uh, all these little gangsters and juvenile delinquents, uh, and in the desolation they they rolled themselves upon me. Terrors are turned upon me. They pursue my soul as the wind, and my welfare passes away as a cloud. You know, when you are in a position of great affliction and suffering, uh, you see and perceive the world very differently from the way people who are perfectly healthy and getting along fine in the world do. That is, you uh, you perceive things like slights that aren't necessarily there. You become hypersensitive to even minor criticisms and things like that. And so Job here, uh, you know, he's, he's made fun of by the local teenagers, right? So, but he, he talks about that as if, uh, uh, it's like a flood of waters coming at him and rolling over him because he's really sensitive to it. He's aware of what he was and what he has lost. And therefore, even the slightest criticism or smirk is to him like, being bashed in the face. He says, uh, terrors, 
Terrors are turned upon me. They pursue my soul as the wind, and my welfare passeth away as a cloud. And now my soul is poured out upon me. The days of affliction have taken hold upon me. My bones are pierced in me in the light, in the night season, and my sinews take no rest. In other words, he's referring to the physical symptoms of his sickness here. By the great force of my disease, my garment is changed. It bindeth me about as the collar of my coat. So his clothes don't even fit him right and they're uncomfortable to wear because of all the, you know, the pus and the, and, and the wounds that he has all over his body. Even his clothing hurts him. He has cast me away into the mire and I am become like dust and ashes. So it's like I've been thrown into a pit. I cry unto thee, and thou dost not hear me. I stand up, and thou regardest me not. Thou art become cruel to me. With thy strong hand thou opposest thyself against me. Thou liftest me up to the wind. Thou causest me to ride upon it, and dissolvest my substance. Uh, For I know that thou wilt bring me to death and to the house appointed for all living. So he's talking about what God has done to him, and he's he's speaking about God in a way that is not fully respectful and honoring. Um, Howbeit, he says in verse 24, he will not stretch out his hand to the grave, though they cry in in his destruction. Did not I weep for him that was in trouble? Was not my soul grieved for the poor? When I looked for good, then evil came unto me. When I waited for light, there came darkness. So he says, for all the good that I did to the poor, look at what's happening to me now. I looked for good and evil came. When I waited for light, darkness came. My bowels boiled. That means he's upset, right? Uh, those biblical people, they, they, you know, we, when we want to talk about our emotions, we say, my heart, right, my heart. But when, when biblical people wanted to talk about, uh, your emotions, they said, my gut, my gut, my bowels. And to us it sounds weird, but, uh, and, uh, but to them, it, it made perfect sense because what's the first thing that happens when you're upset? Your stomach starts to churn, right? And your heart doesn't start. To, you don't p- want to pass out with a heart attack. You you get upset stomach. So, uh, uh, the days of my affliction prevented me. They went they went ahead of me and and waited for me to catch up. I went mourning without the sun. I stood up and I cried in the congregation. I am a brother to dragons and a companion to owls. That means I'm an outcast and the only people who care about me are dragons and owls. Lizards and owls. My skin is black upon me. So my disease is making my skin fall off, rot away. My bones are burned with heat. I have fever all the time, fever. And my harp also is turned to mourning and my organ to the voice of them that weep. The only music I hear is sad songs that make me feel even worse. So that's the situation now. Used to be great. Now, not so much. Then in chapter 31... In chapter 31, he says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? For what portion of God is there from above? And what inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? So, He's, be, he, he's, he's now saying, you know, if I had done such and such, 
I could understand why these things are happened to me. But I didn't do that stuff. So the first thing he mentions here is uh, that he made a covenant with his eyes not to look upon a maid. That is, not to lust after uh, beautiful women. Um, and then he says, Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps in verse 4? Then in 5, If I have walked in vanity, or if my foot hath hasted to deceit, let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know mine integrity. So if I had done the, the, you know, the bad thing, I could understand it. But look, I, I never did that stuff. If my step hath turned out of the way and my heart walked after mine eyes, and if any blot had cleaved to mine hands, then let me sow and let another eat. Yea, let my offspring be rooted out. So if I had done, uh, if I had done evil and turned out of the way and walked after my own eyes and, and, uh, and done only what benefited me, then I should be punished. If my heart have been deceived by a woman or if I have laid wait at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind unto another, and let others bow down upon her. For this is an heinous crime, yea, it is an iniquity to be punished by the judges. For it is fire that consumeth to destruction, and would root out all mine increase. So he says there, if I had been a, an adulterer and a philanderer, I could understand being punished because I would punish such people. Verse 13, If I did despise the cause of my manservant or of my maidservant when they contended with me, what then shall I do when God riseth up and when he visited? What shall I answer him? Did not he that made me in the womb make him? And did not one fashion us in the womb? So he says, if I had mistreated my employees and made their lives miserable, but I didn't. I always remembered that the God who made me made them and, uh, and that we both came from the womb. Uh, and that therefore, they, even though they are my employees, even my slaves or servants, they they need my respect and they need my help. Verse 16. If I have withheld the poor from their desire or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail or have eaten my morsel myself alone and the fatherless had not eaten thereof, for from my youth he was brought up with me as with a father and I have guided her from my mother's womb the widow that is from my mother's womb so if i had if i had used all my goods to feed myself and celebrate and gorge myself and had not taken care of those who were dependent upon me but i haven't done that if i have seen any perish for want of clothing or any poor without covering if his loins had not blessed me and if he were not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have lifted up my hands against the fatherless when I saw my, uh, when, when I saw my help in the gate, then let my arm fall from my shoulder blade and my arm be broken from the bone. For destruction from God was a terror to me and by reason of his highness I could not endure. So he's, he's bringing up all these sins that he could, he could have done, but he didn't do. And if, and if I had done these things, then I could understand the predicament that I'm in. But I can't, I didn't, and therefore I don't understand what's going on. Uh, if I had made gold my hope, 
or have said to fine gold, thou art my confidence. If I rejoiced because my wealth was great and because my hand had gotten much, if I beheld the sun when it shined or the moon walking in the brightness and my heart had been secretly enticed or my mouth had kissed my hand, this also were an iniquity to be punished by the judge, for I should have denied the God that is above. So if I had been, if I had ever been tempted to worship the sun and the moon and to act superstitiously in, in the presence of the sun and the moon, I ought to be punished. If I rejoiced at the destruction of him that hated me or lifted up myself when evil found him, Neither have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul. I didn't even hate my enemies. All right? If men of my tabernacle said not, Oh, that we had of his flesh, we cannot be satisfied. The stranger did not lodge in the street, but I opened my doors to the traveler. Nobody has any reason to complain about me because I was good to everybody. All right? Um, now, as we're reading this, we're supposed to be getting a little bit nervous for Job because he's protesting his goodness a little bit too much to be a pious person, right? Now, we, we can understand it because he's desperate, right? And, and, uh, but he's a little bit too full of himself, right? And you need to... He's a little bit critical of God and he's a little bit too full of himself for his own good. All right. If I cut verse thirty-three, uh, if I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, did I fear a great multitude, or did the contempts of fa families terrify me that I kept silence and went not out at the door? Oh, that one would hear me! Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that my adversary had written a book. So I, I need to talk this over with God. You see, there's this subtle kind of shift that has taken place in Job where he is now thinking that God owes him an explanation. God owes nobody anything but what he has promised. Right? Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. I would declare to him the number of my steps as a prince. I would go near unto him. If my land cry against me or the furrows likewise thereof complain, if I had eaten the fruits thereof without money or have caused the owners thereof to lose their life, then let thistles grow instead of wheat and cockle instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. So here he has, he has said all he can say. This chapter is, is, uh, is, is a kind of a, uh, a tour de force of why is this terrible stuff happening to me? I could understand if I had done all these wicked things, but I haven't done them. God owes me an explanation. And, uh, and then it just says, the words of Job are ended. And that's where we will leave it today. Next week, we get to talk about Elihu. And he, he, be, he comes on the scene and uh, he has something to say to Job, and it's very beneficial for Job. So let's say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.